Thank you for being here today. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you for being part of the Bridge of Life body. Thank you to those who are tuning in online. We are happy to have you, happy to see you. Thank you for those who are in the building. Thank you for being here today. You know, I, w- I want to start us off this morning by taking us on a, on a mental trip. Now, how many of you guys may remember a few months ago, back when we first started Romans, one of the first things I did was we were going to pay attention to where we're walking. That was, that was the uh, Freudian slip. I said what I was thinking about. We are going to pay attention to where it is we are going in Hawaii. Do you guys remember that? I said, we're going to go to Hawaii. We're going to make a trip. We're going to have a good time. Seriously, two people remember. Nobody remembers this. I said, we're going to be looking for a very specific thing in Hawaii, like for four pastor points. Can anybody tell me what it was? No. Tom Cruise with a mullet. A rock formation that looks like Tom Cruise with a mullet. Guys, do we need to start over in Romans? <gasps> I'm listening. <laughs> so I, we talked about a trip. We talked about looking for something. We talked about having intention and intentionality and purpose as we were going somewhere. So today, I want us to go somewhere different in your minds. If you somehow like missed out on the Hawaii trip or you forgot about the Hawaii trip. So today, we're going to go to the Amazon rainforest. We're, we're going to go to the... We, good for you. I love honesty. Yay. Can I go to <laughs> Amazon rainforest? And we're going to be in search of little tiny golden monkeys because there's lots of them out there. They're worth a lot of money. And all we have to do is go to the rainforest and find a couple. And once we come back, I mean, they, you guys seen the price of gold recently? A little gold monkey like this. I mean, we're set. Like each one you buy, well, you can get three Lamborghinis. So really, you can go find one or find 12. But the point is, there's our purpose. There's our drive. There's our reason. And that's why we're going. But Unfortunately, we end up getting lost. You're supposed to be picturing this in your head. You're in the rainforest. Now, now we are about 50 people right around now. So let's just say we went there with about 50 people. And somehow, throughout our wandering around in the rainforest, we ended up separated from our group. We haven't found any tiny golden monkeys. It's been a few weeks, and we are alone. Now, what about this trip are we now enjoying? Nothing. Nothing. We're not enjoying anything. What are you looking for? Now, you may have gone there to look for tiny golden monkeys. That's just fun to say, isn't it? You may have gone there to look for a specific thing, but now that things have gone south and they've gone awfully, and you don't know what it is you want to do as far as keep looking or just have something to eat, you're surrounded by... You know, the temperature is 100 degrees, the humidity is 400%, you haven't had a shower, you haven't had a bathroom, you haven't had toilet paper, you haven't had anything to eat, you haven't had a single comfort at all, and you're laying here face down in the middle of the mud, and you look up and you see like snakes and bugs and crickets and tigers. Now in that moment, you hear helicopter. right? You hear a helicopter. Now, we know a helicopter can't be a toy. A helicopter is only one thing. And so you serve it. The more you listen, the more you hear it. And you look up and you see this big tree. And so you climb up this big tree. You go to the very top of this, of this tree and you're there waving them and you're just, hey, you know, help. And the helicopter sees you. It comes over. It brings down the basket. You jump in. It goes up and they say, are you okay? And you say, yes, I am now. And they say, let's get you home. And you say, okay. And the helicopter flies away. Now, how many of you are thinking, hmm, haven't we missed a step here? Did we miss some sort of vital piece of information? Did we miss communication? Did we miss out on something that really is vital and needs to be told to somebody, but we didn't And as the helicopter flies away, what happens to the 49 other members of our little tiny village that are still lost and alone in the jungle? We have lost our family. We have lost other people because we failed to communicate all that we needed to communicate. Would you agree with the statement that you did not enjoy this treasure-seeking adventure to the Amazon? Would you agree to the statement that you wanted nothing less at the point of your rescue than to just get out of there and put the entire experience behind you? 
But do those two emotions endorse your silence regarding those that you abandoned in the jungle? Obviously, the answer is hopefully no. What about those that are still lost looking for these little tiny golden monkeys? What about those that your silence sealed the fate of? Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 3. We're going to go over chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Last week, we were just uh, able to hear from Roe Todd. That's, I don't want to say that's what they call him, but that's what, that's what they call him, the Messianic Jews. Shabbat Shalom, Roe Todd is the way that we would probably all introduce or greet him if we were going to his church on Saturdays. But thank you very much to Todd for speaking, and thank you guys for listening and paying attention. I think we had a great Sunday. This morning, we're going to get back into Romans 3, continuing our walk through Romans And I've titled my message this morning, The Outhouse. Verses 9 through 20, I'm going to read it for us from the ESV. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Bless the readings and the words of the Holy God. So we're going to unpack that jungle story here together this, this morning, church. We're going to unpack everything that I, that I want to talk about in it, but I want us all to start to pay attention to something. So the thing that Paul has been talking about for three chapters is about to stop in just a few verses. We're going to get to them next week as we start at verse 21. But I want you guys to re- be reminded again this last week as I talk about it, that Paul is not communicating difficult things about sin and judgment and wrath because he enjoys being some sort of out-of-touch, angry old guy. We've all seen the stereotype of the pastor beating on the pulpit and he's sweating and he's shaking and things that you're just wondering if he's going to have a stroke or something. You know, like, that is not what Paul is communicating for. Paul is going all out to communicate to people that think themselves exempt from God's judgment, that they are not exempt from God's judgment. In order to do that, we must allow the truth to cut deep. And that is the heart behind Paul as he writes line after line after line after line of hard truth for the people to embrace about themselves. We're going to get into it a little bit, but I, but I read, want to remind us of my Easter message this morning as we spoke about the euangelion, which is the, the gospel proclamation of Caesar at the time and how it was the good news of salvation that was available to all if you would just but, but, but repeat that Caesar is Lord. And we talked about the verses in, there in Acts where it says that by no other name on heaven can any man be saved except for Jesus Christ. The reason that Peter spoke those words as recorded in Acts and the reason Paul is trying to bring everybody to the same point here is not because these multiple men were just trying to infiltrate things to to build their own church or collect their own salary or just to sort of build their own kingdom of themselves. They knew because God himself had communicated to each of these men that I am the way, the truth, and the life and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Now, to some, that's wonderful news, but to some, that's pretty contentious news. For somebody to say, like, I want to get to God, but they say, oh, well, I want to do it this way. Jesus has told us that that way won't work. And Peter's saying there's no other name. And here Paul is saying both Jew and Gentile, all of the world are sinners. All of the world 
Conversations about sin, Jews, are not just for those Gentile people over there. There's dirty, filthy, uncircumcised Gentiles. The conversations about sin, the acknowledgments about sin, are just as much about you. If we can be honest with each other this morning, I think much of Christianity still has this same mentality. It's awkward for us to confront each other about sin, isn't it? I mean, I happen to be given the gift of gab, is what Pastor Terry calls the gift of gab. Pastors are given the gift of gab. They can just talk, and I can talk. One of my favorite things to brag about is how I used to drive Pastor Terry home from New York, and we would literally talk for like eight or ten hours straight. And Danielle would say, like, about what? I'm like, well, we didn't. We stopped because we got home. <laughs> It wasn't because we ran out of things that, like, like that was a timer. I mean, like, we, we got home. Like, that's why we stopped. And then we did it again next time. So, so, so maybe you don't talk as much as me, but I think that all of us can sit down and talk. A lot of times with people, it's just finding the thing that they want to talk about, right? If you talk to somebody, you're like, hey, how, how are you? Fine. What do you like to do? Nothing. What do you like to eat? Oh, I love pizza. Let me tell you, whenever it's... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just got to keep, you just got to keep after it. And all of a sudden you're like, man, why did I open this can of worms? You know, now they, they text me every 15 minutes. Are you having pizza? <laughs> no. <laughs> so the point is we can have conversations, but we limit ourselves whenever we say, Ooh, I don't, I don't know if I want to have that conversation. So I, so I ask us all, why do we have the, the sudden spiritual insecurity when it comes to conversations about sin. I don't think that it's wrong for us to talk about sin. I think it's essential. And I think that we in Christendom need to be reminded of the fact that we are here to help encourage each other. And in order for me to be encouraged and to help encourage people, we have to talk about everything. It's not enough for us to build up facades or straw man arguments where we just have all of the focus being here because we want it to be here, but yet we have this other thing over here that we don't want to talk about. I think that Christianity had made an error 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote this letter, and I believe that error still exists today. My first point this morning is don't reduce the rescue. Don't reduce the rescue. Romans 3, 9 says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? And he says, no, not at all. Remember the Jews, the select, special, chosen, elected people of God. This isn't just like a group, like it's, a, like it's another football team. This is the chosen, elect, special people of God. And for him to say they're not any better off means we should all pay attention. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, just to make sure you're tracking with me this morning, that metaphorical jungle, that metaphorical rainforest is sin. We were lost, we were desperate, we were, we were without hope until the single source of hope came to us. Paul is telling you and I in these verses today that all men need to be saved because all men need rescue because all men, Jews and Gentiles, are under sin. I remember a few moments ago, whenever I was going into great detail describing how yucky the Amazon rainforest was, and I could just see the looks on your faces. Some of you were just like, everything I describe, each additional description, you just kind of like disconnected a little bit more from me. Like everybody's, just stop. You know, we want air conditioning and, and not 400% humidity. That's good because it's that same level of disconnect that Paul literally brings the Jews to their knees with, with just these, ver- these first few verses, that entire list. You should know, Christian. And that entire list is all Old Testament scripture. This isn't Paul just being mean, saying nobody seeks after God and nobody honors God and no one is righteous and nobody is. This is not Paul on a rant. This is not Paul on a rant. This is Paul proving to those people that thought themselves exempt from judgment that even the Old Testament scriptures said they were going to receive judgment. He says there's no one righteous. No one understands. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The really deep part here is that Paul is using Old Testament verses to prove his point. These words are not about somebody else, which is what Christianity at the time was doing, Christianity. It was like, oh, well, all of those conversations, all the judgment stuff, the wrath stuff, the sinners part, that's all for all of those people over there. This conversation does not need me to be involved in it. 
And I, and I say to us all, that is wrong. It was wrong then and it's wrong now. We should be aware of the things Paul is saying that apply to our own lives. Now, we should also bear in mind here that, that Paul is writing them. This, is, this was an epiphany to Paul's writers or Paul's readers, but it's old knowledge to you and I. You know, what I mean by that is the Jewish listeners of the day were hearing for the first time that Jesus was the Messiah. You and I have heard it for our entire lives. The irony is the fact that Paul was using the Old Testament scriptures that they had all memorized. They had memorized in order to prove they wouldn't have an ignorance of what they said. But yet, they even despite their memorizing, they missed the whole, point, the whole point. And Paul uses these Old Testament scriptures to prove the fallenness of man. Now, listen to it this way. It'd be one thing if I came up with you guys today and I had a Quran here. I have one in my office. I've read it. Not cover to cover, but I know what it says. If I come up here with the Quran and was trying to, to, to witness you to, to convert to Islam, what would you be thinking? You'd be thinking, well, yeah, if he's using a Quran, what else is he going to point me towards? The Quran points you towards something. So, so imagine the aha moment whenever the Jewish le- listeners of this letter heard their own scriptures prove something to them that they didn't want to be true. Do you, do you catch the point? Do you catch my point there? Paul really, they said, no, 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 we don't want to talk about this. In a way, they were like, we want to talk about this. And Paul said, okay, fine, let's talk about that. And and he kind of pointed over and said, you know, the list that he gave. So why would he do that? What What is the point behind this? What is the point behind going on and on and on about being a sinner? This is, this is where it gets awkward because people start to squirm and, and every pastor just loves to look forward to talking about messages about sin, you know, and, and, and calling us out and making us all squirm. You know, sin is not a conversation about someone else. Sin is a conversation about me. We all should bear in mind that every conversation about sin has a piece of us in it. Sin is not a conversation that applies to somebody else. This is the same mistake the Jews were making back in the day. Sin was for somebody else. We're special. And I believe that today Christendom has made the same error. We look at sin and think, well, that just applies to somebody else. It's an old way of thinking. It's an old way of doing things. Christians don't even want to talk, know about, think about, or even feel the need to discuss sin anymore. Instead, we just rather desire to focus on our own emotions or things that make me feel happy or things that make me have a better life or help me formulate a miracle in my mouth. I mean, Christendom has just done this. What broke my heart the most, I, I complain about school. I, a lot of times I say, you know what? They're 20 years younger than you. Give them grace. Part of the problem with school is I'm always working a week ahead. I'm going to talk about myself for a minute. Bear with me. I'm always working a week ahead because I don't like, I'm just one of those people. I hate the word later. I just hate the word later. So I start school a week early and I'm always a week ahead. And since I'm always a week ahead, I generally am the first person to post on our discussion board that's required every week. You have to post, you have to read the stuff, you have to make a post, and then you have to respond to it. You have to respond to at least two or three students. Anybody else do this virtual stuff? Like, it's what you have to do. You're with me? You have to post. Well, since I'm the first one on the board, it's very easy to throw stones at it. Right? Here's a serious moment. It's, pay attention, brother and sister. It's so much easier to throw a stone than it is to build a house. That's why we throw stones, by the way. Back to, back to this. So I put this thing on here, and it was, a, it was a while ago, and we were talking about sin, as Arnie would have it, and I said, hey, well, Scripture says A, B, C, D, and E, and boom. And to be honest with you, I got 100% on this assignment, because how can I be wrong? I just qu- quoted Scripture, and I cited the book. And then there's this response that said, word for word, Christians should not acknowledge sin. And I just sit here, and I just, I just look at this, and I'm like, we never want to identify in the, sin, the sin in our lives once we are saved by Christ. And I just was so brokenhearted. I wanted to reach out and say, my sister, you have missed the entire point. You need to read 1 John and Hebrews and Galatians and Corinthians and Romans and the Old Testament. These things all exist to bring us to these verses right here in Romans all fall short of the glory of God. 
I suppose then there's no need to repent if we don't need to talk about sin. And I suppose that if I allow sin into my life, that it should just be excused. And I challenge us all with the question of, isn't that the same way that you would assume that the Jewish people ended up in the place they were in of error, of thinking sin doesn't apply to me, I'm special? Now, I understand I'm laying it heavy on us this morning, but, but I encourage you, bear with me, brother and sister. Sin is not wanted to be discussed in this generation. I can assume generations before me never wanted to discuss it either. As I said, it's awkward. But even in my school, it's not just this one poor girl that I believe is just simply deceived. It's the fact that it's being preached by very popular pastors with bad theology, and it's a false doctrine to say, you don't have to worry about these things. If I don't have to worry about these things, then I ask you, Christian, why do we need Christ? Why then repent? Why then think sin to be an old, antiquated word? In many circles, we see sin as being a three-letter word. In many circles, including mine in school, but even in back when I was an electrician, people don't want to talk about it. It's just like an old, antiquated way of thinking, just like, wait for it, an outhouse. How many of you all still have or use an outhouse? Please, nobody raise your hand. That wasn't in my notes. I just, as I was saying it, I was like, what are you going to do if somebody raises their hand? <laughs> We've all heard the stories about these little tiny wooden structures, like they put them out in their house. And I mean, the, the, the proof in the pudding here is you didn't put it in your house. Like you put it outside of the house. It was an outhouse. Go take that nastiness out of the house. And we sit here and we listen to these like traumatizing horror stories about, you mean you had to walk outside in the middle of the night when it was cold or raining or snowing and it was like outside? And like it, it, it blew in the wind, you know, and you're sitting here going like, you know, I mean, like, and, and, that's, and that's what was happening while you were trying to do your business. There's no air fresher, no sink. I mean, we, right? It's okay to do that. Except that that's what happens when we start talking about sin. I see it in our conversations. I see it in my classroom. I see it in the world. It's like we think sin is this old, antiquated way of gross way of things used to be, but that's not really the way we do things anymore. It's a that was back then mentality. And I challenge us all to realize, to be on guard for, and to be cautious of a, that was a back then mentality, because it's not. In order for us to say we are sinners saved by grace, we must first acknowledge that we are a sinner. If there is no sin, why the need for grace? The back then mentality has been allowed to come in because we have the new things we want to focus on, like shampoo, conditioner, sinks, exhaust fans, air conditioning. We have these things that make me think, why in the world would I want to use that old, gross thing that's just outside of the blah whenever I can use this wonderful thing over here? Now, don't take this example too far, but I want you to, to sort of go into your bathrooms and appreciate your toilet, basically, whenever you go home. I don't want you to stand there for 15 minutes and like appreciate it that way. Don't bow down to it and think, bless you, you might porcelain bowl, you know. Like we don't, we don't need to do that, okay? But we also don't need to spend, you know, a half an hour like, like condemning anybody that is willing, doesn't want to do anything but an outhouse. Okay, it takes both pieces. It takes both parts of acknowledgement and it takes both pieces in conversation. And I am broken hearted that I see a generation who was coming behind us, behind me, one that I am responsible to witness to, that had just has this no mentality. That was a back then mentality and that gross nastiness does not apply to me. And I challenge you, Christian, my brother and my sister, to know that it takes both parts of this conversation in order for us to thoroughly communicate truth. Not discussing nastiness means we will eventually not appreciate the price tag. Not discussing nastiness means we will eventually not acknowledge all that this is for us. I say again, please don't go home and spend 15 minutes thanking your toilet and your sink, but remember the way things used to be. Remember what you had to endure before you were blessed with something. 
Scriptures tell us, what shall we do then? Shall we remain, you know, decrepit? No. What, shall we boast? No. Remember what it used to be to ensure you'll never have to do that again. But don't forget about that. And don't make the conversation lopsided. We turn the a, a price tag of selflessness, which could be appreciation towards something, into selfishness whenever we say, I will not acknowledge that thing that makes me uncomfortable. Have you ever thought about it that way? It becomes selfishness whenever on our own part about our faith, whenever we say, I will not acknowledge that thing over there because it's just gross, which is the same thing that happened to that rescue in the Amazon. We made it all about us. Instead of going after and chasing after the 49 other ones who are with us who are lost, we turned rescue, flipped it around, and made it only focus on me and not on my responsibility to everybody else around me. Dear friends, may our eyes be open to realize that our faith is the saving grace that all of us need every day to wash ourselves with it and to think that if sin is a conversation for other people, that they're the ones that need to hear about it, then we need to take a double bath, not bubble bath. On the back of your soap bottle, it probably says, rather, or, lather, rinse, repeat. Repeat. Wash yourselves daily in the grace that has been given to you. Be, be covered in grace every single day by the grace that was given to you and is awarded to you and was, was determined to be a salvation plan for you specifically before time ever began. Understand, my brother and my sister, you were worth being crucified for. And as much as that may make us feel special, we have to understand why we, somebody needed to be crucified. And somebody needed to be crucified because of a little word that starts with S, and it's sin. The greatest prank I've ever seen played on anybody, anywhere in the history of my life. 38 and a half years. This is the best prank. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. Yes. Thank you, Rachel. Are the rest of you all sleeping or just kind of like, eh, we don't like pranks? I'm not going to do anything to you. Are you ready for it now? This speaker comes out at youth group with like 5,000 teenagers, and he's like, okay, we're going to let the cat out of the bag. We're going to talk about the thing. It's on your minds every minute of every day. You guys are little hormone factories. All you do is think about the same thing day in, day out. You think about it, talk about it, dream about it. It's your entire world. It's three little words, three little letters. One word starts with an S. Let me hear you. And 5,000 kids just scream, sex. And he goes, I was going to say sin. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm buying your book. <laughs> I want your T-shirt because, man, you got them. Like, I even I'm sitting here going, like, I don't think I should yell that word, you know. <laughs> like, my point is, this man was willing to have a discussion about both sides of our conversation. He then went on to lead to talk about an excellent salvation message. It's about grace and about salvation, about, about dying to our old selves. But in order to talk about the great newness of life that we receive at our salvation, we must acknowledge sin, which is my second point this morning. Discuss both. Just practical advice to ourselves. Whenever you're in the, at your kitchen table in the morning, just doing devotions, reading the word, washing yourselves in the word. The point of discussing sin is not to make anybody feel like trash or make somebody feel sorry for every moment they've ever had fun in their life. That's not the point. That's false judgment. That's unkindness for no, for no purpose. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance, to show us that it is okay for us to say, Father, forgive me. And he says, absolutely. If you are faithful, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. It's amazing. It's amazing. And since we know that we can be cleansed from all unrighteousness, why then do we fear the awkward conversation? What is the fear, my brother and sister, in discussing your rescue? Would you really, really make your conversation about how annoyingly loud the helicopter murder was? Of course not. Of course not. Well, it was cold, and didn't have any doors, and the wind was blowing. <laughs> and if that was my story, even if I knew you hated helicopters, I don't know why, let's just say you do. I hate helicopters. They offend me. 
would I still be willing to share my salvation story? The only thing that saved me was that helicopter. The only way to heaven is through me. There is no other way. There is no other name by which you can be saved. All things point and funnel towards our mighty King Jesus. And the more we acknowledge both sides of our conversation, the more we acknowledge sin, the more we look at this, like the entire Old Testament, like in eight verses, and we go like, oh, like that, that sounds awful. And then you get to say, but you don't have to stop there. The conversation doesn't stop there. If you kept on reading, any time that your scriptures go, but, it's a good place. But God is a wonderful place. And don't do it right now, but verse 21, there's a big but that we're going to talk about next week. Eyes up here. Nobody look down. I saw a couple of you. If you didn't like your experience in the jungle, why would you not save your brothers and sisters? It does not take a rocket scientist to conclude that they're probably having just an awful of a time as you were. Romans 3, 15 through 18 says, Their feet are, are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. If we cared about somebody enough, why would we let them be that way? Now, we may look at it and say, well, that's not the way my friend Billy is. My friend Billy has, has all kinds of money, has all kinds of women, has all kinds of toys, has all kinds of cool stuff. Okay, so you can't see it, but what's his heart condition like? If he has not known the way of peace and his feet are pointed towards misery, why would you not warn him? Why would we not say anything about him? If we truly grasp the depths of that which it is we've been saved from, can we as Christians really have peace knowing that there are others who are still stranded? This is why we discuss both parts. Friends, the root cause of sin is the failure to fear and honor God. And, we, and we, we say that sentence not to weaponize it, not to turn it into a hammer so we can just start looking to poke people with it or just shake it in front of them and say, you better get saved or else this is what's coming. Far be that from me. Far be that from all of us. But we must know that any society that assumes God will not discipline sin, either in this life or in the next, will have no fear of God, which is exactly what Paul said would happen. If salvation is indeed so, so essential, how then could we ignore the effects of sin? We discuss both parts of this rescue story, my friends, and we do it to the world in love because real friends tell the truth and real Christians speak in love. It's recorded in John 13, 35. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It is not love to not talk about something just because we're unsure how those we are speaking to will respond. Perhaps a very, 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 very poor comparison would be if you knew somebody that you were close to was going, getting ready to go into a job interview and they had put on a suit and you know, done their hair and getting done, done the whole nine yards and you look at them and you say, dude, your zipper's down. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to know that before you walked into a job interview? I would. To, to the six people that agree with me, I know the rest of you are, aren't telling the truth. I want you all to know that if you noticed that my zipper was down and didn't tell me, and I went in and got embarrassed, I'd be upset with you. I would look you in the eye and say, you're a jerk. You know what else I'd say? You're selfish because you knew something that could better me and you kept it to yourself. This is where Christianity needs to make an adjustment, dear friends. We need to make an adjustment in what it is we feel that we should be communicating to the world around us. I say it for the umpteenth time. This does not mean we weaponize truth. It does not mean we take scriptures and we just hoping somebody messes up so we can just beat them over the head with it. Of course not. But it does mean that we still discuss both parts of our salvation. How can we have a need for salvation if there is no acknowledgement of sin? We must care for people. Friends, if you truly realize your rescue, you don't mind sharing joy. 
Luke 8.16 says, No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Never be embarrassed about your Christianity, Christian. Never be embarrassed about your faith. Never be embarrassed. Now, I get it. We're all human, and there's like 15 of them, and there's one of me, and somebody's like talking or making a joke about something they shouldn't, and, and all of a sudden, like, eyes turn to you, and you just go, like, Hey, what am I supposed to say? You know, like, Jesus loves you and God has a wonderful plan for your life. And, you know, I get it. I'm acknowledging there's awkwardness. I'm acknowledging there's nervousness. I'm acknowledging that some of us just aren't good at being confrontational. What is it you're afraid of? What is it we're afraid of? If we have truly lit a lamp, we don't cover it up. We put it on the bed. We put it on the nightstand for everybody to see. And this fear-driven thinking of, well, that doesn't apply to me. That's for somebody else. Or I don't want to upset them. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to have them be upset with me. And they're my neighbors, so I got to look at them all the time. I mean, so I really don't want to offend them because they might, like, egg my driveway or something. Like, like, we just have to put all that thinking outside of ourselves and say that that is not the way I am going to apply my faith to the world around me because more than I value the opinions of man I value the opinion of one and if the Lord himself that says I saved you so that you can go make disciples and continue spreading this gospel good news message this euangelion for the rest of the world to hear until I return again then I ask us all together what is it we fear more I'll acknowledge there's nervousness and there's fear in witnessing to a group of 15 people that are all taller than you. But there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. If we truly focus on our Lord Jesus Christ, then we will not have to look through the filter of 15 opinions. We will say, this is the euangelion that I bring to you today. I don't know what you guys are lost in, but I offer this to you. We don't keep, we don't stop the conversation at sin. We don't exclude the conversation of only salvation. We talk about it, even amongst ourselves as believers. Now, up until now, man, it is 12 o'clock. Up until now, I have talked about basically, mostly about a non-believer and a witnessing sort of end of things. But church, I want us to look at it from our own point of view as well. What is it like for believers to have to want to talk about sin? Are we, are we really able just to go, well, I don't have to talk about that anymore. I know the verses that could be thrown at me. Well, he doesn't see you. He, he doesn't see your sin. He sees you know, Jesus, his son. And these things are true. I'm not implying that we should not think that we are not saved instantly. We are saved instantly. Justification happens like that. If you say, Lord Jesus, save me, you are saved instantly, Christian. But there is a place in our relationships for people to say certain things. One of the greatest, greatest comparatives I have to anything spiritually related is the marriage that I have to my wife. And there's places in my relationship for my wife for her to say, no, don't do that. Now there's other times she can go, I'd prefer you not do that. Now, either way, my heart is connected, should be connected to what my relationship with my wife could yield because it is her desire. But there is a time and a place for her to say no, which is also a reflection of my affection for her because even if I could get away with it, do I still want to do it? Even if I could get away with something and I know she'll forgive me, I really do think my wife would forgive me for just about anything. For anything, excuse me. I believe my wife would forgive me for anything. So does that mean I go out and buy a motorcycle and a boat and a girlfriend? I mean, we chuckle, but I mean, hey, if you got a free pass, let's make it worth it, right? As, as silly as that sounds and as nasty as, and judgmental as that sounds, understand that that's the final result of thinking that happens whenever you start saying like, well, since that excludes me, I get to do whatever I want, which is what we need to pay attention to as we go through all of our relationships, including our, our spouses. There is a difference in preferences and absolutes, and there is a place in relationships for absolutes. A preference of hers is that I dust myself off before I walk in the house when I'm covered in sawdust. An absolute in our relationship is that my heart belongs to only her. 
So I, I ask us all, as much as you may agree with what I just said and, and think, well, that doesn't sound like you know, that, that big of a deal. That's probably the same way in our own marriages, right? Let our relationship with our Heavenly Father, be, Father bear the same thinking. If you don't want it, then neither do I. Let that be our heart's cry for our relationship with our Lord Jesus. Even if we are forgiven, which we are, you are saved, you are forgiven instantly. If you confess your sins, you're, all unrighteousness is wiped from your slate, Christian. But let it be in your head that I don't want it. If you're not in it, Lord Jesus, and I don't want it, I don't care if I can get away with it. I don't care if there's something good I could maybe just enjoy for a little bit and then come back and just kind of wipe my slate clean, use grace like a napkin and then throw it away and say, now I'm clean again. Like, woohoo. I would never want to do the hurt that would happen to my spouse. I would never want the hurt to be done to me. Let us bear the same thinking when it comes to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We would be wise to identify all things in our world that negatively affect our relationship with our spouses. Amen? Would we not give our Heavenly Father the same respect? In a world that demonizes anything that is offensive, we as Christians should participate. We should demonize sin. We, our, our level of thinking should not be, that doesn't apply to me. Our level of thinking should not be, well, since I'm saved, it doesn't matter. Those things are immature thinking. A sustaining, everlasting relationship thinks along the lines of, I don't want to hurt you. So I won't. Even if I could get away with it. Is this not the same love we have seen handed to us from said Heavenly Father? I am willing to endure pain so that you don't have to spend forever without me. I am willing to, to lay aside that which may suit me better in order to ensure that you don't have to have a lack of. God did not look at it from the perspective of, well, what can I get out of this? He said, how can I save this? Philippians 3, 8 through 9, church. I'm sorry I'm going over. I know we don't want to, re to have this mentality of judgment as I talk about sin, but it's very easy for us to get confused about whether or not we would ever want to do something sinful again if we, could ever, if we found out that nobody would ever find out. But I ask you this, after you've been rescued from the Amazon and the trip went the way it did, how many of you would ever want to go back? We would never want to go back to our former life, to our old way of thinking, to a life devoid of the presence of God, of having the Holy Spirit living inside of our hearts to courage, convict, guide, lead, and enable us to live the life that Christ wants us to live so that when he returns, he sees us as soldiers in his army acting out and doing and carrying on and pushing forward the gospel of none other than Jesus so that the world around us isn't lost with false Christians that think sin doesn't exist or lost under Christians who have weaponized conversations about sin, but that is properly, adequately understood, conversed about, talked about, and then set aside so that we can say, I'm focusing on Jesus, not on what I can or can't utilize my relationship with him to enable me to get away from. We count it all as loss. We count it all as loss when it comes to sin. Philippians 3, 8 through 9, Paul said, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of, of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Elsewhere in scripture, there's lots of conversations about this mentality of Paul, the words he used. Some, some places it's called dung. Some people it's literally the word would probably, probably be diarrhea. Some people would like to say it's a curse word. The point is that all of the accomplishments that he had was a liquid pile of nastiness. All of those things we count as loss because of one single reason, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. In him, not a fan of him. Not somebody who attended church where they talked about him. Not somebody who participated in the Boy Scouts and led, led groups and did all kinds of good things, good activities, or a good resume. But for us to be found as followers in him, we count everything as loss, which includes our fear of awkward conversations about a three-letter word, three word called sin. 
because we have counted as loss the fear of man and of their opinions with us. And our focus is now on 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Whether we are at home or away, whether you're in your house or at work or at the beach or sitting here in our body this morning, we make it our aim to please him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There is a reason for us to discuss sin, and it is not eliminated just because we became Christians. And I suggest to us all, the need becomes greater because we are saved, but we are still sinners. We are still sinners who need to be saved by grace because we have not received our final body, our final thing. Things are not the way they're always going to be yet. There's a now and there's a not yet. And you, Christian, are a Christian, but we are still prone and we are to sin and we are very highly tuned in to the wants of our bodies, to the needs of our flesh, to the driving desires of these things that our body would crave. And if we're giving in to the temptations of our flesh, we are giving in to sin. And that's why even we as believers must discuss sin. Not for us to be nosy. Not for us to stick our nose in other people's business. What you got in your fridge? Hmm? Oh, look at that. Not what we're talking about. Not what we're talking about. We're talking about no man can serve two masters. Our focus is on Christ. And sin is just disgusting. Let's get that nastiness out of here. Not because it doesn't exist, but because I only want Christ. I count everything as rubbish for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ deeper and better every day. If the worship team would join me on stage, please. If you haven't heard me say anything else today, my friends, I would encourage you to hear me say what I'm about to say. We all need the knowledge of where we aren't supposed to be to help us stay where we need to be found. The last verse I read to you says we should be found in Christ. We have conversations about where we should not be found to ensure we know where we can be found. It's to think sin is something else or for somebody else is an age old lie that I beg you not to believe my Christian brother and my Christian sister. Sin is any action or thought or heartfelt reaction or emotion even that is contrary to the character and law of God himself. To minimize human sin simultaneously minimizes God's grace. To minimize sin simultaneously minimizes God's grace. Let it be far from all of us whenever we have that thought come into our heads, why would we ever want to, to minimize the rescue plan? Why would we ever fear what God has done? Why would we ever look back at our lives and think, man, I used to be blind, but now I get to see, and I don't even want to tell people about that. Our sin holds us back, and Christ sets us free from it. As I bring us to a close today, I want to leave you with this thought. Do Christians sin? Yes. Should they willfully continue on in repetitive sin? No. The capstone on our thought process and discussion today, in addition to these past three chapters, we're bringing three chapters to a message next week. It's meant to funnel us into a position of having no other method of salvation, no other thought process, no other desire, no other anything other than to have our eyes set on Jesus Christ as our Savior, as our Lord, and as our Savior. To minimize human sin simultaneously minimizes God's great grace. The more we seek out a desire to eradicate sin in our lives, the more the gift of grace from God is poured all over us. Don't cost yourself that cleansing bath after you have been rescued from the Amazon. And don't rob your faith of this amazing grace. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning. 
I pray that you please take these words and just encourage us all as followers of Christ, not as fans of you, not as people who like you or are attracted to you, but, but as Christians, as little Christs, as people who are just filled up with your Holy Spirit, that we would understand why we talk about sin and God, that you, you would enable us to take those conversations to, to the lost and dying and broken and, and hurt world around us, and that we would clarify that you would remove old stereotypes, that you would remove false understanding that you would remove clouded eyes that think that the sin word is a bad word and it's judgment and it's a weapon. Lord God, please give us hearts that are tender, hearts that love, hearts that are filled with you so that we can then be, be filled up to be sent out to take your gospel message to everybody that we see where it's not a question or a doubt or a wonder or a worry, but a, an excitement because we know we go covered in your grace washed clean by your righteousness and set up to walk on a path straight to you. Bless my family, King Jesus. We love you. We want to honor you. And I speak on behalf of all of us today whenever I say thank you for forgiving us of our sin. Thank you for being a God who forgives and cleanses and hands us imputed, undeserved, unearned righteousness. To you be all glory, great God. Amen.